Hello, everybody. I'm Beryl Kay with uh, Action for Nature. I'm the president. And uh, we're just so happy to see all of you here today. We have our young Echo Heroes from this year uh, who we're so proud of. We have parents and other family members and siblings and uh, uh, donors, our board. And, and so welcome to you all. Our Echo Heroes are a wonderful group of people. They look out at the world and they see things that need to be changed and they develop solutions and ideas. And they look out at the beauty of the natural world too and, and share that with others. Um, so you are making very big changes to the world. I want to um, thank Layla for all the work she's done in getting this set up. She spent hours and hours and hours and she is um, assisted today by Shreya Ramandran, who was a 2017 Echo Hero. And Shreya is going to make the closing statement today and also help Layla. And Shreya worked on, she won our award for working on gray water issues. And since then, she's worked on conservation of water issues, educated others, started an art uh, competition for children, worked on curriculum for schools, and is now a leading student in Stanford University. So thank you, Shreya, for being here to help us. So we're going to have a opening statement now from Charlotte Michelok. Charlotte, and, and immediately after that, uh, Chris Gioni, is, who is our moderator, is going to start introducing the Echo Heroes. So Charlotte uh, won our award last year and is a person of many, many talents and capabilities, um, too, almost too numerous to mention, but she has worked particularly on global cargo, cargo ship uh, designs, trying to improve uh, and cut back on the emissions from, from cargo ships. Uh, she has also worked on wind issues, uh, she's worked on herpetology in wetlands near her home. Um, and she also, she teaches um, adults and children about these issues. So, she, she, and some months ago, Charlotte, because of her award with us, was invited to speak at a very big conference, the Bioneers Conference in, in California, which I had the pleasure of attending and she got a standing ovation from the 3,000 people present. So right. Charlotte, uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you for an opening statement. Hello everyone, my name is Charlotte Michalek. I am a first year student at MIT where I will continue my sustainability research and community efforts. I am so thankful and excited to be here today. First, I want to congratulate all of you for this recognition. I am also glad for those in attendance supporting these youth. Environmental work in any form, from mitigating plastic pollution to supporting food security and sharing messages through art and writing is incredibly impactful and crucial. This is an exciting milestone, and I hope you see it as an indicator of the importance of furthering your work, letting it develop as you continue to learn and grow. There is much to be done, and we need all hands on deck. I have just returned from sailing 470 nautical miles for my organization. This year, I saw more stranded balloons than ever before on the water and on the wind and habitats choked out by harmful algae spurred on by increases in nutrient pollution. I walked through beach towns where many waterfront pro properties have lawn signs signaling use of pesticides and fertilizers just one rain away from flowing into our rivers, harbors, bays, and oceans. On marine radio, I heard reports of whales caught in fishing nets. While out on the water, I also saw great beauty and resilience. Humpback whales collaborating to hunt food, ocean sunfish basking between migrations to deeper waters. I saw environmental projects in action, designated nesting areas for seabirds, nonprofits working to teach about marine life signs on docks about how to protect marine mammals. There remain ecosystems and populations worth fighting for. 
Through projects like your own, we can work to untangle the many interrelated chains of environmental detriment. Having immersed yourselves in environmental work at such a young age, you offer a current perspective and a valuable head start to thinking about problems and pathways to solutions. One aspect of this award and conference that I continue to think about is how it brings together students from many regions around the world with varied ages and interests. In doing so, Action for Nature highlights how innovative ideas and great feats can come from anyone, regardless of their age or background, especially with the support of communities such as this one. This is a habitat for symbiosis. In addition to globalization accelerated by technological advancements, disturbances to ecological and human health see few human-made borders or divisions between areas of study. This opportunity to connect and collaborate is precious. In fields so dynamic, complex, and significant, there is little need for divisiveness, jealousy, or excessive tensions between efforts. Open-mindedness is key. Know that your contribution is meaningful, but never above improvement, and know that there are people out there to guide you to make your contribution even stronger. I urge you all to maintain deep care for the world, stay current in the literature, get down to the root, be as scientific and as human as possible, seek countless ways to reanalyze and expand your approach and celebrate your achievements together. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> that was fantastic. <clears throat> I think the, uh, the most important thing that we can do is work together Action for Nature and all the Nico Heroes working together. Um, I want to introduce myself briefly. I'm Chris Jorney, an Nico Hero uh, fan, big supporter for many years. And uh, my co host here is Spike from Tree Frog Treks. He's going to help keep me uh, under the uh, time limit. So, without further ado, I'm welcoming the one and only Styrofoam Ninja. I don't know if I can do your cool move, Mandy. This is for uh, Mandy Chitur. And uh, she's our big winner of the Shimon Sports Child Award for Environmental Action. Uh, take it away, Madhvi, and you can be our first one to break the ice with breaking down plastic pollution. All right, can, can, you, all be, can all of you hear me? Gotcha, yeah. All right, great. Uh, so hello, everybody, and hello, everyone here. Um, I am Madhvi Chitor, 13-year-old eco-warrior from the USA. Um, and thank you all. Uh, so much Action for Nature for selecting me to receive uh, this, this Shimon Schwarzschild International Young Eco Hero Award. And I'm glad to be in the midst of all of you here who are, have done so many amazing accomplishments and are such big nature protectors. I have been an eco warrior since I was five years old. Our planet Earth is facing a quadruple threat from biodiversity loss, trash, pollution, and global warming, and they all lead to the climate crisis that we are experiencing now. I have been combating the climate crisis as an activist through my nonprofit, Modvi for Ecoethics and the Ecoethics Global Movement by ushering uh, policy changes locally, nationally, and globally. A uh, few of them are, I made history as the youngest UN child advisor in the formulation of UNGC 26, I worked with Madam Vivi Harris um, on the Global Plastic Policy Campaign. Uh, I banned plastic bags and styrofoam containers in restaurants and grocery stores all across, all across Colorado. I banned PFAS, uh, which are toxic, bioaccumulating, non-biodegradable, per and polyphenols from consumer products in Colorado. And uh, with the US EPA, I brought about uh, legally enforceable reduced PFAS guidelines limits um, in uh, drinking water to four parts per trillion from 70 parts per trillion. I replaced carcinogenic non-biodegradable styrene leaching styrofoam lunch trays to the compostable but gas trays in all 155 schools in the Jeffco Public School District, uh, which impacts 86,000 students and uh, so far has eliminated 26 million styrofoam containers from going to the landfill till date and protecting the health of the students. And I, I fight for every living being's fundamental right uh, to clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean food, and great health. Uh, for, yeah, every living being, humans, flora, and fauna of my generation and future generations. It has a fundamental, uh, yeah. So we must strive to protect those rights. 
Currently, I'm working on uh, the cumulative impacts uh, ruling for oil and gas industry. Thank you, everyone. Climate action now. <laughs> Get the move. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it's unbelievable that you're able to finally get all those guys to drop those styrofoam lunch trays. I mean, can you even imagine using that nowadays? It's, 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 it's absolutely unfathomable. But um, without further ado, I want to tell you that we're all 100% supporting that. And everybody can do one little thing. You know, I hate going to Trader Joe's and getting the clamshells for the strawberries, right? So go to the farmer's market when you can, things like that. Anyway, a nice compliment to your extraordinary, powerful efforts is the very soft-spoken but powerful voice of uh, Benjamin Fallow, our our super artist and hiker. And, Excuse um, me, Chris. Uh, yes. Are there any questions for? Oh, do we want to do questions in between? I thought we'd save those. But yeah, let's do a question if we have one from the audience. I didn't realize that we were going to have time to put those in. We wanted a time for the, the Echo Heroes and maybe the other listeners to ask questions between each speaker Thank you. If, if there are questions. Yeah, that's always a good idea to break things up. Yeah, so keep your ears up and your eyes up and your pencils down. If you have any quick questions or uh, support, you can mm -hmm. just uh, blurt it out. Um, Layla yeah. helps to monitor the, the chat. So go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to let everybody know who's attending. If you want to um, ask a question as we go through, there is a Q and A feature um, on webinar and also chat. So if you feel like you have a question, do not hesitate to reach out. And either Shreya or myself will make sure that it's noted and asked to each eco hero. So sorry to interrupt, but um, we're so excited to to get started. And yeah, I want to make sure we have times for questions if we have them. And we'll also have time at the end. Okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we do have a, a chat question that just came in. Wonderful. Um, yeah, actually, this is from Shreya. So I don't know if you want to ask Shreya. So go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and do that? <laughs> for sure. Um, my question for you, first off, amazing presentation. My question yeah. is, what's next for you? What are you working on now? What do you hope to accomplish in the coming months and years? Are you asking me? Yes. Yeah, uh, like I said, yeah, I'm working on cumulative impacts ruling for oil and gas. I'm working on the global PFAS treaty and global styrofoam ban. And also I want to show uh, the uh, award I got. It's so, it looks so amazing and I'm so glad I got it. Hey. Love to see that. I'm so glad it arrived safely. And um, another question from our, um, actually our board, Barbara, she was wondering, uh, she would love to know what was your early influence for your journey? If you have, what was kind of your, the beginnings of your um, passion? Oh, so kind of what inspired me, right? So yeah, when I was five years old, I watched a CNN documentary called Midway to Plastic Island. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was so sad. Like there were plastics all of the, on the oceans, on the beaches. Um, aquatic birds, aquatic animals were eating those plastics. They were dying because they couldn't digest them. Um, and there was even a big styrofoam ball in the oceans. Um, dolphins and seals were swimming through the murky waters. Um, it was uh, the, and like the water is so toxic over there. Uh, there was the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And so it was just so sad to see. And that's kind of what inspired me to take action. And I have one more thing to say. Um, I'm also working on my Parents to the Polls campaign because this year is a very big and important election. And so I'm, since children and like I can't vote, children can't vote, um, I'm urging all parents, um, grandparents, all adults to vote uh, for government officials that uh, focus and yeah, that are like climate forward or they focus on climate dirt. Yeah, so. That's my campaign I'm working on right now. Great. That is a very good reminder. Political action and environmental action go hand in hand. <clears throat> and along with what you were just saying about being inspired by the film, we're often inspired by art, inspired by poetry, uh, inspired by moving pictures. And so one of the ways that the human spirit is, is moved forward is through these mystical ways. And I, I want to introduce uh, Benjamin Fallow now, our artist and hiker. Um, 
you. Which Thank you. Nice. It's got, um, if you're already in the green room, pull yourself right out. Um, the Mimi Award for Art and Environmental Action. Come on in and introduce yourself, Benjamin. Dr. Mimi Griffiths Jones Award for Art and Ed, um, Nature Education. Wonderful. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm Benjamin Fallow and I'm 10 years old. My project has four parts to it to educate about nature and encourage people of all ages to care for nature through my artwork, writing and videos, to raise money for nature charities through my sponsored challenges and selling prints, uh, prints and cards of my artwork and to improve my lo local ecosystems through creating wildlife gardens and helping rewilding projects. Uh, and to publish a book to raise awareness and money for nature. Um, I walk the S South Downs way to help raise money for different environmental charities. And I raised two thousand pounds, which and then I moved on to do to learn rock climbing and mm -hmm. uh, sponsored climb at Stanage Edge in the Peak District. Um, and um, I, uh, and I, re I joined this amazing charity called Reserve, which created the first youth-funded um, um, tropical reserve in Ecuador. And I protected four acres of cloud forest reserve. They've now moved on to create a marine protection zone in Panama with the Leatherback Project to help mm. <clears throat> different marine species. Um, right. I started sharing my artwork in lock down and I wasn't sure if anyone would be interested but it loads of people got in touch to say that it made them think and made them want to help to protect nature yeah I was inspired by your incredible <clears throat> voice you're, you're so soft spoken but so powerful with your words what they mean, what they signify in the art pieces. Um, what I saw you on top of the mountain with your hands up high going, I did it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that, um, that that's symbolic of how we're gonna conquer some of these challenges? Just do it one step at a time until we reach the top and, and keep plugging forward and keep sharing the beauty and wonder of nature to, and, and, and sort of like inspect everybody with this extraordinary uh, wonder bug. Uh, yeah, and I think it's important that rather than just talking about how to help nature, that we help it and do it now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just like getting out and doing it. I like how you say, I like to walk. When I walk, I see lots of different things. And I think it's like teaching the world a new language. As we move so fast, people <clears throat> have sort of forgotten how to speak nature, if you want to call it sim simplistically, and you're slowing down and then also climbing, uh, digging, growing is, is, is giving that time to unwind and learn that. Any good questions uh, or any questions? All questions are good for, for Benjamin here. And there was one on chat. Yes, there should be a couple. Um, I'm having a little trouble seeing Q&A, but a question is, um, how has your uh, hiking inspired your artwork? Um, well, when I'm walking, I see lots of different creatures and we'll take a photo or do a small sketch and then I'll get home and I really want to draw that creature and help it. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain by drawing it, you're looking, looking again, looking again, and noticing so many unusual details and adaptations to its habitat. Is that correct? Yeah. Wonderful. I've 
Are you are you looking to get more formally trained in your work? Your your details and technique is so high level for your age, if I might say. Um, where 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 are you going next to get more uh, sort of skill honing for your your artwork? Um. Well, we um. Um, it's really hard with school to do a lot of practice at the moment, but I'm going to try and be able to do more, um, <clears throat> quite a lot more drawing and painting. And um, so it, yeah, it's just re it's really hard at the moment to fit mm -hmm. in because, and they don't. I I've never really been to an art lesson before. So. Seriously. Oh yeah, my goodness! It's hard. It's hard if I don't get lots of time to do it, which is why lockdown helped quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you draw every day? Um. Yes, but um, it. Yeah, it's, I don't usually get time to do really good ones, but yeah, I do do some really good ones still. Like well, quite if, <laughs> if you're working on your own, um, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, Jack Laws or John Muir Laws, he's got some really great <clears throat> online courses about nature journaling. If you just look up uh, John Muir Laws and you'll find a whole world of opportunity for lots of good tips, tricks, and time fillers for you that I think will give you some pretty great technique um, and also inspiration. He's a man my age that's been drawing since he was your age and he's doing a lot of cool stuff out there in the world too. Um, let's move on in the interest of time. So I'm going to uh, metaphorically- Thank you, Thank you, Benji. Very good. Congratulations. Um, open up so, that junk drawer. And what do you got in there, right? You got your old cell phone batteries, whatnot. And globally, this project could just catch wildfire that, that I want to introduce next from Sahiti Rada, the e-waste project and e-waste recycling. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit how you caught the world on fire with this and are hoping to get more and more and more buy-in from other groups and organizations. I don't actually have her in the attendees or the, sorry, the panel. Okay. Right now. If you Sahiti, if you're here and that we don't see you, please raise your hand. Um, if I, I don't have you in the panelists right this second. So in the sake of time, we're going to move to our next person, um, which is Roman Jawad. And let me make sure she's here. And sorry, I didn't give you a, more of a heads oh, up that's okay. Roman, just because I thought we might have um, our previous person. So we're going to go ahead and move to you. And then uh, if um, Sahiti comes on a little later, we'll go back. We'll return back to her. So, yeah, and I'll just tell you that Sahiti's work along with her partner was catalyzing ways to financially make it viable to recycle e-waste since it's such a huge growing industry. And they found one organization that would listen to them out of many, 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 many doors that they knocked on. And they were able to um, get some great traction and start recycling quite a bit of e-waste and um, removing lead and cadmium and other things out of the waste stream and putting it into the recycle stream, which was really good. And to make a little bit of a profit to then keep it going. Um, yeah, let me introduce our next one. I like, I like the term um, safer nets with banana pingers. Uh, makes a lot of sense. And these banana pingers will be explained by Roman Jawad about the, the Blind Dolphin Protection Project in Pakistan. And I'd love to learn more about the blind dolphins. When I was a young student at Berkeley, I almost jumped into studying the, the blind river dolphins of the Amazon. And then I went into herpetology instead. So I have a very fond place in my heart for these incredible creatures with their echolocation, extraordinary uh, superhero powers. So go ahead, take it away, Roman. Hi, guys. I hope you're all doing well. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Yeah. So as you said, I was really interested in dolphins, just like you. And they caught my attention as well because of their, like, as you mentioned, their superpowers. Well, in Pakistan, we have this huge river called the River Indus, and it's mostly muddy waters. And here we inhabit one of the rarest species of dolphins, which are the blind Indus dolphins. And these dolphins, as the name suggests, are blind and have really minimum eyesight. So what they use is their sonar navigation system. And their sonar navigation system is one of the most sophisticated sonar navigation system anyone has ever gone through. And it's the most uh, efficient sonar system than any, like, any sonar system created by mankind. <coughs> 
plus uh dolphins uh intrigue me because at, in mammals they have their greatest cerebral capacity so seeing this i um i was interested in mammals and i learned that they get entangled in nets due to um due to some um like uh, problems in fishing equipment and all they get entangled in nets and this causes them to be caught as bycatch and it thrashes their skin or flesh so learning this i learned to make a prototype of sustainable nets and fishing equipment which has banana fingers attached to it why we call them banana fingers they're shaped as bananas and they have small fingers or alarms in it when they're launched into the waters they emit beeping sounds meaning uh they register on the dolphin's radar which uses its sonar system as we discussed earlier and they emit sounds uh which alert the dolphins and they're not caught as bycatch and only the fish that are targeted by fishermen are caught this not only helps the dolphin population but it also helps the fishermen who now instead of catching bycatch catch their targeted fish and they meet their monthly shares and stuff and because dolphins are not sold on the market in the fishing industry so catching them as bycatch did not only hurt the dolphin um, population but also hurt the fishermen and their profits as well and i believe uh, the reason i started this project was because i realized that there there's a really delicate balance between the economic system uh, the economic and ecosystems of this world and not and our water pollution and our danger to such species does not only decrease biodiversity it impairs the water quality and the food security of many people and frankly it's greater than an ecological um uh, problem it's more of an urgent and uh, it's more of an urgent emergency in terms of the animal kingdom and it needs urgent need uh, for conservation efforts and that's why i started this project and i i strongly believe that our um, actions determine the survival of many creatures and our actions determine their survival and that they rely on us for being responsible so that's about it and if there's any questions i'll be more than happy to answer yeah no you hit <clears throat> you hit it right on our actions have far reaching repercussions um one of the quick questions i have and i'll let others chime in is what kind of <clears throat> hurdles did you have to overcome we're one of our first winners from pakistan in getting the word out and getting the people to implement and listen to these extraordinary things that you have to say that are that are so universally true uh, and the need for protection of the river dolphins how did you do that well the most challenging aspect of it was my gender and my age being young and being a female in pakistan and then you go up to uh, someone in authority the first thing they say to you is how qualified you are how ex- how much experience do you have and mostly the the biggest factor that affected me the most was that in the fishing communities most people were ready to change they were ready for the help um i was offering but most of the fishermen they did not want to get um stray away from their orthodox practices because they had been followed by their forefathers and so many generations before wine so they were a little skeptical about that but seeing the improvements they also jumped on the boat and they decided that yes these nets work the biggest challenge all that i also faced was convincing adults to listen because the biggest issue is when a voice is coming from someone less experienced or younger it's not valued as much and that is why i seek out for um awards and recognition which helps a boosting the project because mm-hmm. uh usually a voices in pakistan aren't valued that much as if it's coming from someone else and being young female that was the biggest problem especially in such a um, misogynist um fishing village that i had to go through we go through but i'm happy to say that i've changed a lot of minds there um there were um there we i started one of the uh, other accomplishments i had in this project was i met two wonderful um fisher women who started um um started being the breadwinners for their own homes they're both divorced and one's a widower and mm. they were relying on their neighbors or helpers to help <clears> them <throat> and i was able to empower them into catching their own fish and being able to you know use this more efficient equipment of fishing and being able to earn from themselves which i think is greater 
than any help that they could receive. And that's another thing I'm really proud of in this project that I could actually help and bring a change for someone and their future generations. Oh, absolutely. Um, I could go on and on celebrating your achievements because you hit so many topics right there that are so prescient right now, tumbling the, the patriarchy in America. We're hoping for some positive change with some new leadership as well. Do you have any other questions for her that I didn't get on there? Did you see in the chat? I think we're good. Let's let's continue. Okay. We'll circle back if um, people have questions. Yeah. Thank you, Ramon. And uh, once again, I applaud you and celebrate your extraordinary achievements. Well done. Well, Thank also, you. another really strong female winner, Rory Hu here, has just, I think, created such a, a cool way to feed honeybees with your little tape halters, um, the, the, the phenols from coffee and tea to see if they might regain some of the memory that got taken away from them with the miticides and such. Um, would you introduce that extraordinary project? And it, it looks like you're president here from the White House picture on your, your side. And tell us how you got to that point from your honeybee conservation research uh, project. Thank you, Rory. Uh, yeah, well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rory, uh, rising ninth grader from California, <laughs> USA. <laughs> Um, and some of my passions include journalism, speech and debate, and of course, science research, which was the basis of my project. So my research focused on honeybees. Um, they're an essential part of the ecosystem, accounting for one third of food production and billions of dollars in the global economy. Uh, however, there has been a severe decline in the honeybee population in recent years, and that led me to conduct a science research project uh, where I sought to improve honeybees learning and memory after exposure to deadly miticides. Um, so basically, I tried to see if compounds found in tea and coffee could help the bees learn better, which would in turn improve their rates of survival. And so my key findings were that tea polyphenols and caffeine were able to and even improve the bees learning and memory. These results are crucial because beekeepers can add tea polyphenols and caffeine to their sucrose, which could save millions of bees. And after my science research project, I focused on promoting beekeeping and getting the news out to the world. Um, so actually the picture uh, with me at the White House represents one of my passions for journalism. Um, I actually used to be a reporter for Time for Kids and then mm -hmm. uh, Nickelodeon. And so I hope to use the platform I've built up as a journalist to start sharing um, what I know about bees and promoting beekeeping. And so after my research, <clears throat> I became the vice president of the Bee Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness around bees. And I've organized several events such as presenting to an elementary school on Earth Day or giving a seminar at a local farm. I also hope to change the restrictive bee ordinances in California that hurt local beekeeping. Um, in fact, like just last weekend, I set up a booth at the Campbell Farmer's Market and distributed flyers about bee <laughs> ordinances. Um, and I've talked with several city councils in California and hope to eventually remove bee ordinances so that beekeeping can flourish. So even though my research project is now over, <clears throat> I'm still trying to help the bees with this next project that I'm working on. And I hope that my work can inspire youth just like me, that whether you're doing science research, whether you're doing advocacy, whether you're just distributing flyers or you're trying to change legislation, all of us can do something no matter how big or how small to change the world. <laughs> that is a tremendous discovery that you've uh, <clears throat> unearthed there because also it's, it's so accessible, right? The polyphenols and caffeine. So jumping on the back of, I guess, some ideas that are already out there, are, are people now instilling this technique to uh, address the, the main issues you're talking about? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> some beekeepers <clears throat> in my area have actually started using this method. Um, specifically, for example, the beekeeper that I worked with during my research, as well as several other beekeepers who are in the bee initiative. You want to tell everybody a little bit about how you developed the harness to hold the bees? Because that was crucial to your ability to feed them the tea polyphenols and stuff. Oh, yeah. So um, one part of my experiment involved the proboscis extension reflex, 
Uh, essentially, when bees are stimulated in their antennae, they'll stick out their tongue or their proboscis. Mm -hmm. Um, And in order to do this type of experiment, I actually needed to restrain the bees in a safe and friendly harness um, so that I could provide them the stimulus safely uh, without hurting either myself or them. Um, so I couldn't actually use the professional like laboratory harnesses um, at the time because uh, I didn't have access to a lab. And so what I had to do was actually design a harness by myself. Um, so I tried a few methods, but I eventually came up with a harness uh, using tape um, that was able to safely control the bees. I had it approved by the beekeeper. And this harness was beneficial because it could hold the bee safely in place. And then after the experiments, I could easily remove the harness and set the bees free again. Yeah, I thought it was such a great example of a cope adjust adapt, kind of like You know, <clears throat> we used to say in my generation, the MacGyver technique, making, you know, opening the lock with a paper clip because it looks so simple, but, but just is perfectly suited for it. So that, that's a, a great example of try, try again until you figure it out. And then it worked perfectly. So I'm sure you had a lot of early designs that weren't quite ready yet. <laughs> Any questions for, um, for Rory Hu on the amazing work with honeybees? And then we'll get Maria in the green room here. Yes. Was one from Shreya on the chat. Yes. Um, what, uh, how do you measure learning in bees and what kinds of learning are they doing? Are they doing? Oh, uh, yeah. So in my way, <clears throat> um, so my experiment primarily focused on visual and olfactory learning uh, for bees. And I tested this using the proboscis extension reflex. using Pavlovian conditioning. So essentially, I gave the bees a certain scent. Uh, in my case, it was a peppermint scent. And then I fed them <clears throat> sucrose at the same time. And so the learning I tested was to see if they could associate the peppermint scent with the sucrose. So when I give them the sucrose, they automatically stick out their tongue. Um, and so the my, my way to test learning was that I gave them the peppermint scent Only. And if they stuck out their tongue waiting to receive food, that means they had learned to associate the two things together. And so that was how I measured learning. That's fantastic. Really cool. Really cool. And of course, we go all the way back to the waggle dance when we were just shattered in the biological world with understanding communication and other animals besides humans and how extraordinary their way to communicate food and location and direction and all that. So the Un, it was unbelievable. Nobody believed it at the time. None of the uh, entomologists thought that bees could do a waggle dance and tell each other what was going on. So once again, it seems like you're on that cusp right there. So thank you, Rory, and congratulations. Um, the next winner I want to introduce is Maria Ruschetska. And we have as well uh, a new country to support and applaud Ukraine. Uh, Pakistan and Ukraine are some of our newest winners this year. We're so extraordinarily uh, humbled and also um, delighted to, to welcome Maria. And I know you have a, a translator possibly to help, so we'll go nice and slow so you can introduce the rainwater catcher that was critical for fresh water uh, distribution in Bokhrov, Ukraine. Go ahead. asking her to unmute. Mm -hmm. There we go. Hello. Can you speak a little louder? We can't quite hear you. You have, can you get closer maybe to your microphone? Sorry, get a little closer to your microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk closer into the microphone. Hello, my name is Maria. I keep a smile on the in this uh, of This is in Ukraine. I am the uh, particle of the time in the present and the project uh, Ryan Castle Water for the Sky. Uh, where it's the uh, need. I will uh, barely uh, recall the history, the project, and uh, uh, how uh, what met in the Uh, happened uh, do ex, uh, do to explore in the Kahoska Hydroelectric Power Station. 
Pokrop, tak mani oči šitis in ze tvo vaš let vidhovačer ze teacher in ze raiden, in ze klasmej. Tu friend in ze reablim solution in ze for the round the culture all the time set is itself in the set in this for then use it in the effective effective over in preamble in pleasant and and visit imelant imelant together with on the Teacher, expert, mentor, and the makers. We say use before I struts the structures. This will help course and rain rainwater. And we should second collect in this way the water in the cute cell in the cow can. Was will in the water in the flowers, the garden. Use in the use for the calendar in depend in the on the entirely in for real. You can assemble into forty show little spread day. Implant, im, make the contrast constructor during the course plan association. Explain all the time in the help in the Polina Krasova for the startup Optisan and Bogdan Velhan in show Sweden. Next full time come to Kiev in the great prototype. Have you the her you the the supervision in the Olga Ivanchenko in the and all the hack club Kiev makers the idea to turn into physical object object during the days. The past we drive club guy in the recent early Africa's articles. Ryan was organizing the Leiden to so complex and and great things this to complex as go the anti one. The factors helped helped to time to rise in the result and to the big idea problem platform to contain the work. Next time with the help the teacher and the my parents, the much this in the catchers during we we were we have. Uh, able to uh, restaurant, uh, restaurant to uh, uh, envir uh, environment, uh, environmental uh, culture. We found uh, option in the in, uh, innovation to make this world the sustain, uh, sustainable on the right. <clears throat> Catch uh, has holes in the skin in summer on the of in Bochumar in Bochumar and to fight in the victory of our national Ukraine. Maria, let me let me recap one or two things that I know that I gleaned from your earlier presentation and your project. Catching rainwater was critical because the dam was broken in in June 2023 and prevented any water from reaching your town due to the Russian invasion, and then. Roof catchment wasn't possible because of the fact that the roofs may have had asbestos and other issues with them catching rainwater off off a roof. So you invented this extraordinary umbrella technique that, you know, if, if any of you saw the video before, you're in the workshop with the sanders and the blasters and the cutters making the stand 
to hold it and putting the umbrella together with leftover billboard ads and things like that. I can see some banners and using whatever you have, um, catching the water. And then it's a great picture of you guys playing with the water, delighted to catch it. I'm hoping there's enough rainwater to go around, but I'm sure you're, you're trying to distribute as many of these as possible. Um, one question I have, and then we're, we'll recap more later, is how many of these are out there now? And what is the, the, the future for getting some fresh water back to your village, your town? Do you know how many we've, we've got in circulation now? It looks like quite a few of these big are out there. Yeah, it's a phenomenal project. Very action for nature and action for people in action for the planet. Um, and also you can't, you can't have biodiversity preservation and humanitarian aid without peace. And I think you're a messenger of peace as well, which is so clearly in need and mindful, you know, wage peace on biodiversity. Is there anything that you wanted to add? There is a question on chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we did ask a question, but um, I'm not sure we don't have, we were hoping to have an English translator today um, who wasn't able to join us. So mm -hmm. um, ideally we can maybe ask her some questions towards the end and then um, uh, maybe a, the, her translator will be there by this by that time so we can get a little bit easier. I know it's hard on screen, you know, to do all of that. So thank you oh, so what? much. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I wanted to make sure everybody saw the, the hearts and the celebrations coming up. Um, we don't usually do this during the Eco Hero Award Ceremony because we're trying to race through things, but I want to take um, 10 seconds to just have a moment of silence for peace in our world and our hearts and in Ukraine. So let's do that on three, two, one. Just a symbol of how powerful silence and celebration can be together and i appreciate all your work maria and we are wishing for uh closure and movement forward in a positive way very soon in ukraine uh right now though on a completely different note but still working with water uh we have talaria watkins who i absolutely adored reading about the work you did getting this thing out there from just bare bones Sir, uh, and making this garden. So let us know, Talari, about how you're feeding the world with your garden. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, my name is Talari Watkins. I'm a 16-year-old mushroom farmer as well as an urban farmer. I'm from Blacklick, Ohio. And um, I am the CEO of Tiger Mushroom Farms and the Garden Club Project. So my business, Tiger Mushroom Farms, um, I started when I was seven years old after a Cub Scout project had ended. We grew cat grass and basil, and it was so interesting to me that I wanted to keep growing stuff. So then my parents were wondering, what could we grow in the winter in Ohio? And I said mushrooms, because mushrooms could grow in the... I learned that at school when I read a book. So... Learning about how to grow mushrooms, we researched um, how to grow mushrooms online and on newspapers and different ways that we could find the information. We found a website called Back to the Roots, and we bought our first mushroom kit from them. I grew my very first mushroom from their kit, and I learned that I had a very big passion to grow mushrooms. And so we continued researching how to grow different mushrooms and different mushrooms that we could grow until eventually we had too many mushrooms to eat. Mm -hmm. And so we had to sell them at farmer's markets. Nice. And so my very first farmer's market or one of my first farmer's markets that I had sold my mushrooms at, I noticed that there were some people who were using currency that wasn't money. They were using plastic coins or wooden coins to pay for their fresh produce. Mm. I turned to my parents and I asked them, Where is it some of these people using currency that isn't like money. And they told me that some people don't have um, money to feed their families or themselves. And so they have to have, they need financial help from the farmer's markets in order to uh, pay for that fresh produce. I wanted to help with that. And so I applied for a grant called Katie's Crops and I won 
I used that money to build raised garden beds and donated um, cucumbers and carrots that I grew to my very first local food bank. After that, I had another passion to help my community. And then I went and were, I was doing Friendsgivings, which is a way for me to raise money and awareness to childhood hunger, as well as food rescues, which I, I went to restaurants before they closed and took their unsold food and donated that to local food banks. Uh, I then, um, after you know, 2020, uh, most of my activities um, in the community had shut down. And so when um, every all the activity um, started back up after, after like 2020, um, I decided to start a nonprofit called the Garden Cup Project um, with the goal of ending childhood hunger and encouraging kids to eat healthier. And so I do I do that by um, I have a garden right now that I'm working on. I have food that I have put into the ground and I'm growing more produce um, to donate to local food banks. Um, a couple of years ago, actually, my one of my first um, community gardens, I had managed to donate a little over 250 pounds of food to a local food bank. And so right now I am working on my new community garden in order to do the same thing. Well, your work seems really, besides obviously grassroots and extraordinary, um, scalable. I mean, the kind of you're discovering and taking action on to train people on something so unusual as raising mushrooms and food for a full year crop is fantastic. Do we have any questions in the chat? I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to create a garden, but um, my, my first thought is it must have taken you quite a bit of time to get the soil and things ready. But then once you got rolling, did you just become a green thumb and just got swept away with all the excitement of growing your own food? Um, at first, the getting the soil was a little tricky and um, hard, but we didn't, after the Garden Cup project had started, people had started um, donating soil to the Garden Cup project. And so um, we do have a lot of like reserve soil that we use for the gardens and it's enough to grow produce. Yeah, and, and we have a term called, you know, food deserts here in San Francisco where people aren't getting access to healthy quality food. And I'm sure that that's one of the things that you're discovering. Um, what was one of the questions that you saw? I just saw something pop up. Was there one that you wanted to ask, Talaria? There's two questions. Yeah. Yes. Um, were there already community gardens in your area or did you create the first one? Um, in the Columbus area, there were other community gardens. They were very small, but um, we weren't the first one, but we were the first ones in like the small communities that we are operating in. Um, we're the first people like who took the land um, and created a community garden. Our first community garden actually was we rented the land from a church and there was already a garden <laughs> there. Um, and that she used for, you know, farmers markets and community gardens as well. And so, no, we weren't the first community gardens in the area. Yeah, and I just pulled up the chat, too. I was thinking just what Barbara was. Are you going on into a career in agriculture? Because you seem super well suited for this type of work. Um, yes, I'm planning to go to college in OSU for their agricultural engineering program. And I'm planning to get a, a field in agriculture. Mm hmm. I love it. I love it. I think we're going to have to start growing things on the roofs and the backyards. I mean, backyard habitat is such an untapped resource across the United States. Uh, thankfully, we still have backyards in a lot of areas. And of course, the cities have the parking lots. And although I don't like autonomous driving cars, you guys may not know it, but San Francisco is the, the focus point in the world uh, among besides China and other places like that. Um, we have a lot of technology of having driverless cars. So if we have driverless cars, then we'll get rid of all our parking lots because the cars will be in use 70, 80% of the time instead of being parked. And then we can turn all of our streets and parking garages into gardens, right? And natural areas. So that is a good positive, even though it's a little bizarre having a, a driverless car come by. Anyway, something to think about for the future, right? In your generation. Um, any other thoughts that you want to share with us, Talara? I'm very impressed with your work. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think I have any other thoughts though. All right, well, I'm going to introduce uh, Kiara next to again in the green room that she's got a lot of thoughts to share since she was four years old. She's been talking, I think, 
faster than myself uh, very, very clearly and distinctly um, and reading as well at an early age, uh, learning about the world. She's our, our spokesperson for nature and climate change action. So Kiara Carr, take it away from Abu Dhabi. Greetings to everyone present here. Yes. This is Kiara Carr, world's youngest TEDx speaker at COP28, COI18, World Expo, and Commission on Status of Women 68 at United Nations. Firstly, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Action for Nature to recognize young souls who have been and are working to slow down climate change and taking responsibility and action to contribute to the solutions to save our planet. My journey started as a very curious child, which led me to read many books. And soon I set a world record in reading at the tender age of four years. Slowly it paved a path of learning and researching on social issues going around the world. I started awareness campaigns on climate change solutions like planting trees, composting workshops, beach cleanups, and representing youth on the national and international platforms like COP28, COI18, World Expo, and United Nations headquarters. As the leaders of tomorrow, it is pivotal that youth are informed and engaged with the global vision for the future. Over the next few years, youth will not only directly experience the outcome of SDGs and plans, but will also be the key driver for their successful implementation. For this reason, it is vital to raise awareness on youth about global issues, build a platform for discussion and create the conditions for active engagement, like today at this prestigious platform. So I would like to emphasize on to never stop questioning. Whenever a question arises in your mind, don't leave it unanswered. Read, ask, discuss, and research to get your answer which is going to eventually become the answer of many unpleasant situations going around us. Mm -hmm. I congratulate the whole team behind this event to provide <clears throat> opportunities to young people like us to feel empowered and also becoming the source of inspiration to others to make this world a better place for everyone. I also want to congratulate all the winners and achievers who have not left the hope to make this world a better place for everyone. <laughs> With this note, I want to congratulate everyone present here and extend my gratitude to the President Beryl Kay and the whole team of Action for Nature. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Will you tell everybody how old you are now? Ah, uh, yes, I'm eight years old. So just put that into perspective. You've been doing this work for half of your lifetime, which is pretty insane, right? So you've got a lot of half your lifetimes ahead of you to really hang your hat on a bunch of bunch of new achievements yet to come. Um, and I really like the message. Get out a question, research it, check it out, and then answer it and then keep moving forward. You know, that is, I think, the crux of being a scientist you you go oh that's weird i wonder why that happened and then the discoveries come it's not generally oh i'm gonna have a eureka moment right it's just by sorting through all this different data as charlotte will tell you you know out there and the waters and then these things come to you like i wonder why that's going on now, that's weird and then you keep going so i can't tell you how much of an inspiration you are and you're so um for for lack of a better word just is so earnest and and sweet and direct so i appreciate that positive attitude i hope you get many more years of extraordinary uh spokesperson so very good we're gonna um segue into victor very soon so get yourself ready victor thank you um, thank you very much um victor Shu has created I, it's kind of cool the green society it, it reminds me of um 
your your cool logo like a mixture of alien science fiction shapes with green cutting edge technology architecture there it is um embracing green inspiring change Could you explain this sort of um this almost like the the logo to me inspires like what we call in the business industry like the dog and pony show where you want to tell somebody exactly what it is you're doing or the elevator pitch because it's like what is that that's so cool and then you can tell people what it is you're doing so i'll let you explain it victor thank you very much Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Victor. I'm a 16 year old from Canada. And first, uh, first of all, I really want to thank Action for Nature, um, President Beryl Kay and the team for acknowledging all these really amazing young people for these um, initiatives that they're doing. Um, and essentially what I've been doing the past two or three years is working on my nonprofit called the Green Society. Um, I started this nonprofit just uh, two years ago in 2022, and since then it's grown to an international organization, currently spanning six different countries, being Canada, where I'm from, the US, England, China, Australia, and New Zealand. And we're officially registered as a 501c nonprofit uh, with the federal government of Canada. Um, currently, there's around 40 core members, and we're partnering with over 12 global organizations to raise awareness on not just environmental issues, but also social justice issues, um, which are also in, uh, interconnected. And um, I think it's really important that uh, what our slogan is, embrace green and inspire change, because um for in order for people to create change and to um, have young people inspire change, like many of the Eco Hero Award winners, they need to first embrace the fact that climate change is real and it's really impacting many of our everyday, um, uh, essentially tasks. Um, anything that uh, we do today is impacted. So they first need to embrace that it's happening and then they can inspire change. Um, what the main thing that my nonprofit does is we have mainly two different events. Um, our first is we develop workshop curriculums, environmental workshop curriculums. Um, they're developed by finalists of the Climate Science Olympiad, which I also competed in recently. Um, I believe that our curriculum can be really helpful to young people because it's developed from the perspective of young individuals. Um, and it's directed towards young individuals. So that perspective really helps. Um, our other event is in environmental writing contest. Mm -hmm. It's annually and it's held in partnership with an organization called the Starfish Canada, which I'm a part of. Um, and it's basically an environmental advocacy journal. In the past, we've featured many different judges, most notably Jane Smiley, who is an American novelist that received the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the Fitzer Gold Award for Achievement in American Literature. Um, we also have many members of the Starfish Canada, which we're partnering with uh, as judges and other authors and environmentalists. Um, currently, one of our larger projects is focusing on um, helping out or helping out raise funds for a school in uh, Kenya, Africa. And mm -hmm. we're partnering with one of the nonprofits that one of my fellow friends is running. He will be raising the funds for the school and our organization will be helping to allocate those funds towards service to help make the school sustainable um, and environmentally friendly. And um in addition to TGS, I've also been working on some other research projects related to green energy, um, cancer biology, and how different chemical carcinogens affects that, and different uh, science projects that I've exhibited at different fairs, such as the Canada Wide Science Fair. Um, and I would say that most of my work started when I started reading um, a genre of fiction called climate fiction, um, mm -hmm. short or, or not short, but the short term is cli-fi. Um, cli-fi is really interesting to me. Initially, I wasn't really a good writer, but when I started reading climate fiction, I started writing my own climate fiction stories, uploading them on my blog and as a member of the Starfish Canada. And this really inspired me to create the writing contest and eventually the organization that has um, grown so much today. Um, and in the future, I combine my passions for environmentalism, science, and writing climate fiction um, to drive meaningful change and enhance our planet's well-being. Thank you. That was so well-spoken, Victor. Just 
dynamite. And I think you're on the very cutting edge. I honestly barely knew what Cli-Fi was before I ran into your work. And now I've seen a whole world of it from science fiction movies to, you know, it's beyond science fiction, Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451 type of stuff and alien invaders. It's like dystopian reality slash possible utopian reality from these different uh, perspectives. So I want to tell you that this is a great example of how a young eco hero project has opened up this generation, our generation to this, this whole new idea. And it's not surprising that it's gained traction in six or seven countries and probably many more to hone your powers of observation with work like Benjamin did with his art in the UK and then you with writing and a good example too, is just to start from scratch. You know, I couldn't believe Benjamin didn't have any art lessons. And it sounded like you were working with, you know, creative writing, uh, beginning techniques and is, it opened up this world to just let it flow and so it's a good reminder for all of us that it doesn't really matter if you think you're any good at it just try it and just keep at it and if you like it and love it then then it'll come and your message is very strong so is there any questions for Victor I now realize I could check the chat myself here easily um, I don't see any off the, the top of my head but do you have plans to help blow this out to the rest of the uh, the, the world, Victor, with um, Green Society writings and the, and the cli-fi or pitching this to Steven Spielberg before he retires for his next movie? Yeah, um, definitely. I think um, like you were talking about how um, Benjamin wasn't really doing any art lessons before he started his art. That was similar with me. Um, I wasn't really strong in writing before. I think it's really important that um, I didn't believe that I could be a good writer, um, but if you write about things that you're really passionate about, um, it's not necessarily like the writing skills that you have, but it's the ideas that you're able to convey um, that are really important. And I think in the future, I just really want through the Green Society and the environmental writing contest we have to inspire younger people to be, um, to like want to write, uh, not just like, oh, I, I don't think my writing is good, so I'm not going to write. It's not going to make a big change. But if you're like really um, interested and passionate about an issue, not necessarily uh, climate justice, um, if you can write about it, that's really like a voice, a means of conveying a message to the world. And I think that what we're doing, um, we're trying to inspire more people to write and raise awareness in their own ways. Yeah. That, once again, is just super, super well put. I've got a great question from Shreya here. She would like to know your thoughts on the power of imagination for social change, such as we just talked about science fiction leading to reality and, and cli-fi leading to positive change. What do you think about um, the yeah, power of imagination of for social change? Um, I think imagination is definitely really important. Um, in the past, before I found out about climate fiction, I was reading a lot of stories that were sort of just like, oh, there's this new technology that's helping uh, impact climate change. There's this new technology that's helping the environment. Um, and really, a lot of those articles are really helpful. But I think... Um, many younger for especially younger individuals it's harder for them to grasp the concept of those technologies and how they're really helping the environment but with climate fiction it really lets you just let your imagination loose and what you're writing is sort of like you know you're creating a movie you're creating a fictional world for example one of my stories i was writing about um what like essentially what we're doing to animals now in the future in an alternate reality if we had those roles reversed what that world would look like and creating these sort of fictional worlds and scenarios um, using your imagination obviously would really help people visualize what climate change could truly do to our planet um, and that could motivate them to want to create solutions to stop it. Mm -hmm. Well once again among many other applicants and, and winners. We could keep talking about this, but the fact that you're linking pure science, imagination, and practicing your ability to uh, empower change and be empowered to speak up, I think is clearly what the Young Eco Hero Initiative and uh, program is all about. So congratulations again, uh, Victor. We're gonna bring uh, Bristol up into the green room. And you know this is kind of a sci-fi thriller in its own right, because Monarchs represent the butterfly, the monarch butterfly, a very outrageous adaptation to eating a poisonous milkweed plant to become the most flamboyant, colorful, 
butterfly that flies the farthest of any around the uh, migratory pathways. And, and it brings it back to what we would also call um, a species specific model or a species specific platform, um, just like we had earlier with uh, honeybees um, and uh, Rory. So can you give us some ideas, Bristol, about how your focus on helping the milkweed growth and the, and the monarch has built out into conservation in general? And uh, congratulations. Hi, my name is Bristol Joseph. First and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for setting up the award and giving the awards to all of these amazing people. My project is called Magical Milkweed Market. And the point of the project is to We lost you for a second there. Did you click on mute? I see your pictures though. I think she might've frozen, shoot. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can. We'll, gi we'll give you a second to cut Maybe. back in. We can't hear you right now. Yeah, her, fr her screen froze unfortunately, but um, we'll see, hopefully she can, can get back on. Um, While we're waiting, uh, you just go ahead and interrupt us when it comes up. We're introducing a very young entrepreneur, as you can see, who found a way to raise awareness with selling milkweed plants to give monarch butterflies uh, a flyover food supply on their large migratory pathway across their, um, the U.S. and down to, into Mexico um, and across the Colorado Rockies on both okay. sides. There's do you there. Okay. Can I see you hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Just start all over again right. from the beginning. My mom's phone got all messed up. It's really hot, and it just like went out. Oh no. Okay, so um, hi, my name's Bristol Joseph. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you so so much for putting together this award and giving this award to all these wonderful people. My project is called Magical Milkweed Market, and the point of my project is to be able to distribute milkweed plants around my community. So a milkweed plant is the only plant that monarch caterpillars eat, and it's the only plant that monarch butterflies lay their eggs on and the eggs hatch on. So I, basically the whole life cycle happens on this plant, and it's very important for their survival. So it is going down with the milkweed, the milkweed, there's not a lot of it anymore because it is a native plant, but a lot of people are mowing their lawns and it gets mowed down and they're putting pesticides and chemicals in their yards and it's killing the plants. So due to that, the monarchs or population is also going down and it has a very low population right now. So I want to be able to distribute that and interest people in this project and be able to show them that it's very important to have milkweed in their yards and be able to help the monarchs. So I also go to libraries and festivals, all sorts of different markets. That way I can, again, interest people and try and teach them a little bit about that. Um, I also raise the monarchs in my yard with my own milkweed plants, and then we release them and they go on their migration to Mexico. And I really would just like to try and help that and get that population to go up through everybody's different efforts. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Bristol. I, I want everybody to know that you've been at this for several years. We can see in the picture there that you were a young girl when you got into monarchs. So obviously, people wonder what it is that caught your eye with the monarchs. Was it the beautiful orange and black colors or just the life cycle? What got you started on your pathway to being queen of the monarchs? When I was very young, I was I have a lot of different siblings and they are all were very into nature and I was little, so I always looked up to them. And my sister, she's a marine biologist. I was just always surrounded by it. So whenever I heard about their population going down, whenever I was just like, oh, I want to help. What what can I do to help? I was little and I was like just trying to research it with my family. And this is what we figured out. And then we started just by distributing them at um, garage sales in our yard. And then it just got bigger into different markets and festivals to just help. <laughs> 
That's fantastic. Well, here in California, we have a pretty huge um, contingency of monarch lovers in places down in Monterey, Silomar, Pacific Grove, and Santa Cruz, and natural bridges where thousands upon thousands, and maybe even millions of tourists come and visit, and there's the monarch parade. And so we, we echo your sentiments. Um, and then I, I've had a chance to go down to the San Pedro Martir Mountains in Mexico by coincidence many years ago, and I heard some of those hilltop areas are where they also overwinter. So I, I like you, hope for uh, the best. And I think this is a good example of uh, do what you can when you can, and then maybe your garden will catch fire, just like uh, Tellario's Watkins garden, and we'll have more and more stopovers for them. And as a symbol for everybody here, I have a nice bouquet of dahlias and others to celebrate all the eco heroes. I wish I could give them to you, but then the monarchs reminded me to bring that out earlier today. Any other questions um, for right now? Let's see. Um, and we'll have more Q&A also at the end. But a great example of a specific system, the monarchs, opening up the door to conservation in general and also to a way to l ask questions uh, about the monarchs and what they need for others. Yeah, Beryl? Uh, just to mention, Echo Heroes can also ask questions of each other. That's right. Yes, right. I thought that was um, clear, but we want you guys to as well. I know we're actually right at the halfway mark and we're doing um, very well. If you consider our introductions from Charlotte and Beryl um, mm -hmm. to have some Q&A at 12 o'clock at the end. Um, and if you have to stand up and go to the bathroom or get a cup of coffee or get a drink, you know, go ahead. You don't have to stay glued to the screen. In fact, it might be good to do your um, pinky workout right now so that you can get some stretch. So your, your brain and mind are relieved of uh, target vision fatigue here. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anybody else have any questions for you, uh, Bristol? I want to say I hope you continue to continue to do your work as well. And you're also one of our middle middle young eco heroes. Are, what is your age right now? I'm 11 right now. 11. And did you start when you were like around six or something like that? Yes. Yeah, that's impressive. Another half of one's life commitment to a project. So I appreciate the, the dedication and love that you offer the, the monarchs. Um, Thank you let's so get, much. You're welcome. Let's get another uh, spokesman up on the platform, Elijah, who's taken it to the next level from a sleepy village in Northern Queensland to the world through YouTube and of course, Hawaii now and uh, getting down and dirty. And I like how you get different points of view, Elijah, with all of your videos on the ground, underneath things, in the water, up in a tree, in the, in a gas station bathroom with um, uh, beautiful uh, Australian carpet pythons. So give us a, a little bit of a whirlwind tour of what it's like to be Elijah Richardson and advocating for oceans and reefs. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Action for Nature Eco Awards for letting me be a finalist. And I also really feel honoured to be among so many young eco heroes that are doing incredible work. So my name's Elijah and I am 11 years old. And so I live in Australia at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland. And so I was the first Coral Watch ambassador, or I was the first Coral Watch youth ambassador, and so Coral Watch is an organisation that is trying to help the ocean life and the Great Barrier Reef by educating other people and by using the Coral Watch health chart, which looks like this. So I love work being an ambassador for them and they do incredible stuff. And I'm also an ambassador for Tangaroa Blue, which is an organisation that helps the ocean and ocean life by organising beach cleans. And so they do the beach cleans and then they go up further up the shore and they put all the rubbish on a big top and then they sort through it and they put it into their database, which they have. And so mm -hmm. it gives them an overall understanding of the rubbish and then they have to and then they try to stop it from the source. So they try and stem it from coming from the source. And so another mm. and a big passion of mine is making videos on my social media and Instagram page. And so I make these videos to try and educate and inspire people about what they can do to help 
the natural world. So I put videos on about how to make Bezac straps, which is a great alternative instead of cling film or aluminium foil. And I also do beach cleans to educate people that they can just go out to their local beach or anywhere and do a cleanup. And I try and educate people to use less plastic, refuse plastic and recycle plastic. Yeah, and you have uh, an insatiable enthusiasm and appetite for sharing. So, of course, as a fellow Australian, our little bearded dragon here is going to give you a thumbs up. Right on, Elijah. Keep it going. Of course, he's in the uh, the desert regions, but I'm sure you're familiar with all the crazy herps in your neighborhood. Will you tell us one of those cool stories? What was it like? I got to ask you, walking into the gas station and finding a carpet python six foot long wrapped around the... Uh, the handles we, we usually find cockroaches or maybe a mouse or a rat in our bathrooms that's a pretty extraordinary discovery well we were actually doing a walk of our local beaches to where the turtles nest and hatch the biggest turtle rookery in the southern hemisphere so it was the public toilets there and so we went in and there was a very big carpet python on the toilets and on the handle and so then we noticed that there was actually a dead possum on the floor. Ooh. So of it seemed that the carpet python had wrapped around the possum, then tried to swallow it whole because that's what snakes do. But the possum was a little big for the python, so it didn't quite manage. And so the possum was just lying there. Oof. That's fantastic. Yeah, we want to keep wilderness in the wild. Maybe not in the bathroom, but it's nice to see that you've got the wilderness out there. We have a, a rescue center, Tree Fire Treks, and we've got several carpet pythons and um, brettles pythons. And I can totally identify with your extraordinary uh, surprise seeing that. And it would be so cool to see one in the wild. Yeah, extremely unique. Exactly. Uh, any questions uh, for Elijah, who is I, spreading I, the word I, far and wide? Yeah, I actually have a very quick question. I, I actually, I live here on the big island of Hawaii. So I'm just very close to where Elijah is now on Maui. And uh, oh, yeah. we, I would, I'm very curious and you don't have to answer live or maybe you can share a link with us. And I'd be happy to share it to our social media channels is where can you get one of those coral reef health cards? I've been uh, very curious mm -hmm. about where you can get one of those because uh, I think that would be really helpful to just make people more aware of that coral is living. And, you know, I see a lot of that here, just people being not being aware of what coral is and, and what, what it looks like when it's healthy or not healthy. So I'd be curious if mm. you thought that. Yeah. So there is a Coral Watch website, so you can go onto there and you can order your free chart. And so it's absolutely free and then they'll send it to you. And so they're very simple to use. You just find a coral, be diving, snorkeling, reef walking, and you put the chart next to the coral, and then you measure what color the coral is on the chart. Mm -hmm. And so, if the color of the coral isn't on the chart, then we don't measure it. But if it is, then we put the lightest and the darkest, and we put that on the back. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, recently we did go on a snorkel and we did fill this out, and then you also put the type of coral, so whether it's boulder coral plate coral, branching, or soft coral. And so the way you can tell if it's healthy or not is most of the time, if it is the darker the color of the coral, the healthier it is because the more zooxanthellae that is in it, which is which has a symbiotic relationship with the coral. Mm -hmm. So it's a microscopic algae, the zooxanthellae. But yeah, and you can just get it off the Coral Watch website Awesome. Thank you so much for that quick lesson. That was super, uh, I, something I'm just starting to do at my age. So I really, it's exciting to hear from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, once again, another absolutely massive project that we want to reveal to the public is that the, the coral reefs across the world, in particular Honduras and, and in Australia, are needing some stewardship, just like the, the gardens and the rainforests of the world that we know need stewardship. And if we can find ways to help bring climate uh, tolerant corals back in and climate uh, resilient corals back in and do some gardening there, we can help keep the habitats healthy that have been around for literally billions of years. Um, and so that's a really cool way that you can turn people onto that. And not everybody's underwater. So it's nice to be able to 
turn more people on to what is going on underwater. And you're at the epicenter of it, Elijah. So I'm hoping uh, for a very positive outcome, even though we know it's a very um, challenging story with how climate change can negatively affect coral reefs. Um, let's see. I thought I saw something pop up and we're getting ready for our next uh, person. Yeah. Amazing site. Well done, Thank everybody. You, Elijah. Thank you for that. So, Anrid Rao, I got to tell you, yours is a super, super, super cool tech idea that we can um, detect tornadoes with their like. You you can explain it better. There, 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 there's certain <laughs> frequency hertz. It's like sixty miles away before they get closer. So instead of visually, we can we can sense this with um, drones. Presumably, the drones won't get taken away by the tornadoes. They're far enough away to be able to assess this. So you're 11 and in Colorado. Tell us how you got into this, Sunny Root, and what, what's going on with your tornado early warning system called Revere. Hello, all. My name is Anya Drow, and I'm from Lone Tree, Colorado. And thanks to Action for Nature for this wonderful opportunity. And congrats to all the Echo Hero Awards and winners. Every initiative is inspiring, and I can learn a lot from here. So my initiative started about three years back, and it's working on an early tornado warning system, which is based on infrasound, which is a low frequency sound from 0.5 to 10 hertz. And it can be detected from over 60 miles away, and it's produced by tornadoes in their early stages. So my idea was by using a network of autonomous drones, infrasound, and other environmental um, factors, I can create an effective early tornado warning system. So my solution that's in the prototype stage is more of the autonomous drones. And I've also added environmental sensors such as temperature, pressure, and altitude, which are very important in finding tornadoes. And it can increase the warning time from 13 minutes to 40 minutes. So mm -hmm. I'm working on patenting this and I've been working with the NOAA for further data analytics and projective modeling to predict the tornadoes well before the season. So I started working on this based on inspiration. So one of my friend's home, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee much before, and my friend's home was destroyed in a tornado. And climate change is something that I'm really passionate about. So this problem I really wanted to solve. So further research showed that about 75% of tornadoes in the entire world happen in the central USA. And the problem is worsening due to climate change. The tornado alley in the United States is moving eastwards and it's much more densely populated and people are less ready currently. So in addition to a technological solution, I've been bringing awareness to the tornado problem, prevention and safety measures to different schools. I also conduct like technical workshops such as 3D printing and beginner AI, the after school clubs and museums. And one of my favorite quotes on climate change by President Barack Obama is, we're the generation to feel climate change and we're the last one to do something about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool. The way you connected your passion for climate change and this early tornado warning system. Um, I got I to gotta imagine that people would love to just take this and replicate it and get it out there. Because as you said, Tornado Alley is, I mean, these topics are so prescient. Um, Elijah's work on coral reefs right now, like they're in the Science Times right now, on the Tuesday Science Times, what's going on with coral reefs. And there's um, nature photographers in the National Geographic uh, describing and um, demonstrating what's happening with increased tornadoes in the Tornado Alley, as you just mentioned. Have you had people approach you for your quote unquote patent or your technology? Because, you know, if you got some big, uh, firms behind you, you could probably get these out there in the people's hands right away. Uh, I had um, this nice lady. Her name is Dr. Sarah. She works in the USPDO in Colorado. So she reached out to me and we're going to the patenting process. And I also have like a patent lawyer. I got it from like an award. So I'm really excited to patent this and I hope in the future I can work more on this project and make it so I can actually work it in places. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, you're on the right track. You're working with 
NOAA, which I'll tell everybody is the National um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, which is basically the federal organization that tracks all weather across the world from the United States and specifically ocean work and currents. And um, they definitely provide you with some guidance getting this out there. I want to also note that this is a neat project in the context of our Eco Hero Awards, which historically have been more, like I said, animal or plant based. And, you know, yourself and earlier Charlotte are linking technology with direct outcomes that relate once again to nature. And so this is a neat synergy and evolution of, of our own program over the last 25 years to uh, su support and also celebrate your work. So thank you very much for, for being a part of that and taking the risk to put this out there. We really can't tell you how uh, timely it is. It is very, very timely. And speaking of very, very timely, since the days of uh, Jacques Cousteau 50 years ago, jumping in the waters and finding the very, very first plastics in the ocean to, to now, um, now I'm going to ask you, is it Aluga Manesh or is it Manesh Aluga to, to let, tell us a little bit about your really great work with plastic bricks? Because I watched your video several times and I was just in awe of all the different things that you're trying to do to sequester plastic pollution, to use it and to, to get it down there. So introduce yourself and tell us about the Kundu Waste Management Program straight all the way from Nigeria, another one of our far flung Eco Hero Award winners. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Aluga Manasi from Nigeria. I'm the founder of Kundu Waste Management Project, which seeks to solve plastic pollution in Nigeria. You know, in Nigeria, an estimated 32 million tons of plastic waste is generated annually. Why these plastic waste are being discarded without a thought and take an astonishing 500 years to decompose. They in, this plastic, uh, this plastic pollution poses a, a significant threat to our communities, wildlife, and ecosystem. And this is a challenge that calls for quick, innovative solution. I started working on plastic pollution in, 2002, in 2022 after witnessing the rising problem of plastic pollution in my community. I watched several documentaries about waste management to understand the problem better. That really inspired me to develop the idea of converting plastic waste into eco-friendly building materials such as bricks and interlocks. As part of my project, I have successfully designed and built a custom plastic shredder that grinds the plastic waste into smaller pieces. The pieces are further mixed with sand, cement, and water in a specific ratio. After mixing, then I mold the plastic waste into bricks and interlocks. I am also engaging with the community, educating them on proper waste management practices and the benefits of recycling. I am also organizing training sections and uh, awareness campaigns to you know, spread the knowledge on waste management. I am also forming my team, the Kundu Waste Management Corps, actively involving them in the collection and recycling processes, as well as creating advocacy in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had in the past different types of plastic bricks presented, like melting the plastic and forming it into what we have often here in, in the U.S. is different kinds of like uh, plastic decking or plastic benches or things like that. But yours seems to be much more robust and, and solid. Can you tell us a little bit about that brick wall behind you in this picture here? Is, is, are these bricks uh, more resilient and or the material goes further when you add the plastic. And of course you're able to take on a whole bunch of different dirtier plastics all at once, I would think. Tell us about those bricks. Well, um, my bricks are, you know, um, are very strong because I tested them. Uh, I hit them on one another to test its uh, strongness. I also, um, I, sold out some bricks and the buildings that they have been built with the bricks are very strong and they have stand for so long. And also, um, I am selling out the bricks to, um, to, to blocks industries and also 
um, individuals who come to buy and because they have heard of equality, who come to buy and build their houses and do um, other things with it. Yeah, I really like you're able to mix the two. We've also seen any here years ago, push plastic, soft plastics into two liter bottles to make um, bricks like that as well in areas that didn't have the ability to make these, these types of building bricks. So I'm imagining that you might be also very sought after to replicate and put more of these out there because we know that there's way more plastic pollution than we know what to do with right now. And in terms of recycling, this is a, a very uh, important endeavor. So congratulations. Let's see if there's any other questions for you on uh, this regard. And um, yeah, doing fantastic work. Anything else you wanted to add, Aluga? Because um, being from uh, Nigeria, you're one of our uh, international workers that put a lot of extra effort, a lot of extra hurdles in that, that we can't even imagine being here in uh, US, Canada and Australia. What was it like to get this off the ground for you? That would be my, my last question to you. Was it was it really challenging, or did you have some support to get it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please, would you say again your question? Uh, what was it like to get this started for you, to get it off the ground, to get the project moving? Well, right now, um, I have only two shredders on ground, so I want to buy two so that I will fabricate more shredders. I also got another grant award from the baccalaureate, which sponsored me with $3,000. So I will combine the money, buy tools, and fabricate more shredders so that the grinding process of the plastic will be flowing more than before. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Well, I can only imagine that you're going to get more and more positive feedback to get these bricks out there. Well done. Um, let's see. It looks like we might be missing uh, Tejas Pugalia, who had threads for good, another way to recycle things that are overly uh, thrown away, overly abundant in our environment. So I don't know if you've yeah, caught on recently. I think yeah. he's um, not on the, uh, he's not on the attendees right now, so we can skip over him and hopefully circle back if he does. Um, but just as a quick recap, he has been recycling, um, you know, old clothing, cloth and things and making them into bags for children who do, would another would not otherwise have school bags to go to school. So really amazing project. Um, please go online to learn more about him. We are actually also missing Yashwin. A few people today had their SATs. Um, so they either had to join a little late or join a little early um, and then hop off. So Yashwin is also an amazing young eco hero looking at um, uh, Charlotte, you'd probably be very interested in this, um, some Marine Guard project that he's doing as well as Anglers of Tomorrow, which is involved in um, making sure the fishermen of the future are being very aware of the environmental impact of fishing and how that how they can actually help the environment with fishing. So really, really interesting project. I encourage you all to check out online. And so- and didn't he also use oh, the, yeah, uh, to interject the, uh, the seaweed to sequester Yes. Any pollutants as well, or Marine Guard? That is exactly right. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, the Marine Guard part of that is is amazing, a very innovative scientific project. So he's kind of got a two prong um, project there, and I I hope uh, if he is not able to join us in the last half hour here, um, we I highly encourage everyone to check out his work online as mm -hmm. well. So we mm -hmm. actually have um, Sanvi uh, from Texas up next. Yes, Sorry, let's introduce you more of a heads up. <laughs> yes, Sanvi, you're going to um, go head to head with Elijah in your ability to be a spokesperson and adventurer and a traveler and a hiker and a trekker around the world and, and also Benjamin. So let's introduce uh, Sanvi Sita Milavarapu uh, from Texas and tell us about how your project Nature helps you, your mind, heart, body and soul and inspires others to uh, reach out and get out and explore and share about nature. Yeah, thank you so much. So I first started, my journey with nature started when I was really young. I was around six years old. I remember going to my first national park and spending time outdoors has really, really just 
become a huge part of my life. And it's also not only helped me with my mental health, my physical health, but it's also helped me connect to the connect to nature, understand the importance of sustainability, understand the importance of protecting our planet. And I was privileged enough where my parents would make sure that I was getting exposure to nature at least three or four times a year. And when I say exposure to nature, I mean these like big national parks and state parks and traveling to places just so me and my brother could get that experience of being outdoors. And when I would come home, I'd realize that even in my own community, there were kids who weren't getting that same exposure to the outdoors. And as I slowly realized the vast impact that nature had on my life, I realized that it was key to make sure that these youth in my own community were able to get some of the same benefits from the outdoors that I was as well. So I started Project Nature Worthy to first just expose youth to the outdoors, especially disadvantaged youth, and create outdoor experiential days for these kids to go outside, explore state parks, uh, go on a trek, or even um, attend a junior ranger program for the very first time. And so working with uh, various organizations, such as working with my state park and creating junior ranger programs, and also working with national nonprofit organizations in order to lobby in Washington, D.C. and help pass some of this legislation that would make it easier for these disadvantaged youth to get outdoors. So some of the legislation that I, I helped advocate on and help pass as part of Project Nature Worthy was the Transit to Trails Act, which hasn't passed yet, but it, it was introduced a couple years ago, which basically just ensures that people have equal transit, equal access to transit to a lot of these trails and nature preserves, because a lot of the times, if you don't have a car, or if you aren't able to afford gas, it's really hard to get to these places that are hours away at some times. Um, one act that we were able to get passed through house was the Explore Act, um, which mm -hmm. helps uh, children spend more time outdoors and just make the outdoors a priority. Um, we're trying to, when I was in Washington, D.C., See, I think a couple months ago, we were trying to get the AORA Act passed. And we also introduced a new act um, called, I also helped introduce a new act called the Play, Play Act, which um, ensures that kids have equal outdoor access to playgrounds. Because a lot of the times we don't even think about playgrounds being a priority, even though they're one of the main ways that children get exposed to the outdoors and spend time outdoors, especially in a place like Texas. There's a uh, playgrounds is a huge issue because a lot of times playgrounds aren't built with the idea of building shade, especially when it's so hot in Texas, um, building water fountains around playgrounds and building all these various amenities to get children outdoors comfortably and safely as well. So with Project Nature Worthy, I basically just create outdoor experience days. Um, we're also building pollinator gardens and educational gardens. So um, I'm working with Operation Pollination, which is uh, part of the which is part of ASRAG, which is the environmental, which is like the Rotary Action Group for Environmental Sustainability. And with them, I'm helping with their pollinator projects. And we're also working on getting nominated for the Earthshot Prize to uh, give to kind of disperse milkweed all over the United States and especially focusing on Native Americans and their tribes and getting milkweed back to their tribes so they can plant them in their own communities to help the monarch population flourish. So overall, we just work on various ways of getting kids outdoors, getting people more in tune with the outdoors, and finally just making sure that they're able to benefit from nature. Nature is shown to increase your serotonin levels, your dopamine levels, and just making sure we're reconnected with nature is one of our biggest priorities. Well said. And Bristol, I'm sure, is excited to hear about the Milkweed Project as well. So you've got many prongs. You've got the, the mind-body connection. You've got from the very first connections of playgrounds, maybe with even more naturalistic areas around playgrounds. You've got uh, hiking and state park programs. Um, are you positioning yourself possibly to be one of our advocates for science and nature in your career? Um, you know, we've got people in the Department of the Interior helping with that. As you said, the fourth graders getting them out to national parks. What, what do you see to the adult edge of this potentially gargantuan hurdle of getting nature curriculum and access interwoven with our lives more deeply. Yeah, that's definitely what I want to do when I grow older. I think meeting 
Secretary Deb Holland. I think the picture is right there of me and her. That was that was a huge inspiration for me and just hearing her work and, you know, how she got to the position where she is. Um, mm -hmm. That's definitely what I want to do when I go. I'm going to call I'm applying to college now. So um, in college, I want to study environmental science and public policy. Mm -hmm. And from there, I want to pursue a role probably in the National Park Services or the Department of Interior um, or in the EPA and just climb up the ladder from there. That's fantastic. Well, we're really excited to hear your speak. Um, let me double check our chat at this point to see if anybody's got any thoughts on that. Many people are saying it's absolutely critical and important, not, not just from the point of saving nature, right, but getting people even to the point where they're ready to embrace nature for their own health and benefit, and then giving them enough energy and focus. And once again, as many of you have said in your speeches, the connection to, to, to love something, to be interested in something, as uh, Benjamin said so eloquently, and then from there to take action to steward it and protect it and also to share it. So I think that goes right back to our beginning statements of having this community, as Charlotte mentioned, of, of interwoven ocean seas and sky eco heroes putting out the word um, from practical things to uh, specific species specific things so well done um, what we're going to do and thank you for introducing all the different projects that you're doing that other people can take a part of there um, Sandy as well fourth graders and and others in the U.S. one of the things um, that we keep hitting upon are pollutants in our environment and and how we can reduce them or sequester them or change our technologies around them and you know, faster the better, but things do happen slowly. And remember, do what you can when you can. And so we're now gonna introduce one of our last eco heroes on our list here, um, Lisi Priya uh, Kangujam, who created what I think is one of the most imaginative and powerful opportunities for change in the, in the plastic pollution network. She calls it the plastic money shop. And I think it's so poignant and wonderful that I'll just go ahead and why don't you, let's see, why don't you introduce it yourself and let us know what it's doing in India to help reduce plastic pollution. Yep, thank you so much, Chris. Well, hi guys, Kurumjiri Namaste. My, na my name is Lissi Priya Kangujam. I am 12 years old currently, an Indian climate activist and the founder of the child movement. I'm the special envoy for the president of Timor Leste, and I'm fighting to save our planet and our future. Thank you so much, Beryl. Thank you so much, Leila. Thank you so much, Chris, and all the other people. Like, it's a great honor, I have to say, a great pleasure from my side to like be considered as one of the winners for the Young Eco Hero Award. Thank you very much once again. And I was born in Manipur, which is a small, beautiful northeastern state of India, which is full of rich biodiversity. But now all those rich biodiversity hotspots have become climate hotspots now. Even though I grew up in Bhubaneswar, Odisha, for my schooling, which is another state of India. Well, during my young childhood life, I faced a lot of environmental issues, such as the cyclone Ditli in 2018 and the cyclone Fani in 2019 in Odisha. And then after that, I moved to Delhi in 2019. And I again faced the intense heat waves and the high air pollution level, which has worsened even now, like till now. Like, we the school children who go to school every day can't even breathe properly inside our homes, inside our school. We have to wear our masks every day. It's, like, really hot. So, like, in summers, we face intense heat waves. And again, in winters, we face the high air pollution crisis. So, after facing all these environmental issues in such a young age, in my childhood life, it all turned me into a child climate activist so is we all know about you know the global climate crisis and like there's another huge big problem known as the global plastic pollution crisis and it's it has had 
it is having a huge impact in our mother nature, in our planet. And who has caused it? Us, the human beings. So, to tackle the global plastic pollution crisis, I have made the world's first plastic money shop where people can bring single-use plastic waste from their homes and can take free rice, stationary items, or a plant sapling. And after collecting all the single-use plastic waste, I again turn them and recycle them into household sheets, road tiles, school benches, desks, etc. So the mission of my project is to eliminate every single-use plastic from our planet, and it also stops the single-use plastic waste from reaching our oceans, rivers, seas, landfills, etc. So yeah, that's my project, and I'm also calling out as an activist. I'm also taking a lot of initiatives, uh, other than the plastic money shop, and to save our planet and our future, because. You see, I believe that every child can lead the change. And in order to save our planet and our future, the first step that every human being, everybody has to take together is, you know, to change our behavior in order to save our planet. So we have to change our behavior to save our planet. That's the first step that we have to take. Otherwise, there would be no change, no difference. And one more thing. All our little things can make a huge difference and age doesn't matter to make a change, to make it, to bring difference in this world. So we all will continue to fight until we achieve our goals. We are unstoppable, another world is possible and change is possible. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> well done, Lissitra. Yeah, we are unstoppable. And for me, one of the key elements to your extraordinary plastic money shop is that you've added value to a commodity that the industry has said is is valueless. Just like in the ancient days when we used to have bottle um, deposits. So kids, when I was a child, I would take my Coke bottles back in and get 25 cents. Then it became cheaper to have disposable bottles because the industry could make them so quickly and throw them away. But then they never told anybody that the cost was hidden in picking them up again in the environment and pollution and disaster. Well, glass wasn't as bad as plastic. So what you've done is added value to that again, almost like a plastic deposit. So you can bring them in. And as you said, you can get um, rice or stationary paper products for school or a sapling. And it's a feel good transaction. And it's also adding value. And you're trying to find at least an alternative, just just like a, a luga to the plastic waste and turning it into something useful like a brick or, or a, yeah, a bench. But b- bottom line is we don't want any plastics that are going to be single use anyway. And that, of course, goes back to behavior. And I will say when plastics were first invented, it was um, accidental, as it were. We were researching how to make something called a shellac, which is from a shellac beetle. And um, the gentleman had invented uh, Kodak film previously in the 1800s, 1890s, and he invented plastics. And he thought, okay, bakelite is what it was called. It was going to be solid and last forever and be used for products forever. But then it became cheaper in the 70s to make it um, disposable than lasting forever because we could make it so fast and easy with the fossil fuel. But now we obviously have to transition out of that because our behavior has not uh, recognize the the, the the true cost of the plastics to the planet. So I want to thank everybody for being so uh, articulate and also uh, far-sighted to see that there are hidden costs that most people don't recognize. You know, it's not there is no a way, as many of you have mentioned. And climate change is knocking at the door, saying, "Hello, this is not going away." Um, we're going to introduce our closing speaker now, uh, Shreya. It goes without saying that. You have, um, gosh, five years, six years later, gone to make uh, seven years, seven years later, uh, a big splash in the world. And uh, I've seen some of your speeches and some of your work. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, Shreya, and let us know what it is that you've gone on to do as an inspiration for yourself, your family, and others here at Eco Hero Conference. 
Thank you so much. And it's really wonderful to be here back at Action for Nature. And can I just take a second to say all of your projects are absolutely incredible. I feel like I was learning so much just listening yeah. to everyone's presentations. This is such an inspiring group to be a part of. So I'm going to very briefly share a little bit about my work. And I also have a couple of takeaways that I want you all, as you are entering this Eco Hero Action for Nature community, to leave with and think about as you go through the rest of your day and the weeks ahead. So hi everyone, my name is Shreya Ramachandran. As it says on the slide, I'm a 2017 Eco Hero Award winner and I'm currently a senior at Stanford University. I serve as class president there and I'm on Stanford's Climate Action Advisory Committee and Director of Students for Sustainable Stanford. And like many of you, I was moved to action after witnessing environmental challenges. I witnessed water, con water scarcity and drought firsthand both in California, which is where I'm from, and also in India, I saw how people were just affected deeply by the lack of water. And I actually had to, when I was in India, I was standing in line to collect water for even basic needs like drinking and bathing. So it was a combination of witnessing these things and experiencing them firsthand that made me really passionate about water conservation and really determined to do something about the global water scarcity issue. So my project was focused on developing alternative water conservation methods that could help us tackle drought and water scarcity worldwide. And I applied to the EcoHero Award with my research project, where I was trying to determine if gray water, which is the lightly used water from sinks, showers, baths, and laundries that makes up 60% of the used water in an average American home, if that water could be reused for irrigation instead of using like clean tap water for irrigation. And it turns out that the answer is yes, and it's a really effective water conservation solution. And when I applied for the Eco Hero Award, I had just started my international profit, the Grey Water Project, through which I advocate for the safe reuse of grey water and promote it as a solution. Now, almost seven, seven plus years later, the need for water recycling is greater than ever. And my organization continues to strive to bring awareness to this important issue. And I'm trying to really fill the gap by providing education and also support for implementation for this really effective water conservation solution. So it's been really incredible to be a part of the Action for Nature family over the last several years. And since this is a virtual gathering, it might be a little bit difficult for you to really appreciate the fact that you are now part of this incredible community of change makers. So as you leave today's event, I want you to think about three main things. Firstly, I want you to be proud of all of the work that you've done. It's been your incredible effort that has brought you here today. So take a moment, celebrate all that you've accomplished, and thank you for the work that you've done for your communities to make the world a better and more sustainable place. I know for me personally, it can be hard to pause and reflect and really see where did you start, where have you come, but you're making progress every day and you're really contributing to creating a greener and more sustainable future. Second, find ways to connect with your fellow eco heroes. Is there someone whose presentation really inspired you? Is there someone who's doing work that you're like, oh, this is really cool. Maybe I can collaborate with them. Don't let this be the first and last time that you interact with these other amazing young people. Find those connection points and keep in touch with each other. And third, you're now part of the Action for Nature family. Like, woohoo! Action for Nature is an incredible and supportive organization, and everyone on the team here is super invested in your success. So, there are also potential resources for you to reach out, learn from them. And once you're part of this community, you're always part of this community. So whether you want to report back and check in six months later, a year later, five years later, just know that this is a space that you can come back to. And finally, I want to just acknowledge the incredible leadership of the president, Beryl Kay, who has been a steadfast supporter for young environmentalists over the past 20 years. Thank you so much for your dedication, without which we would absolutely not be here today. So could we take a second and give her a gigantic round of applause for her and also everyone else on the staff for yeah. Action for Nature? Yes. Woo! And you too, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And thank all you. Right. That's all I've got. Um, <laughs> thanks for letting me do the closing here today. Um, it's It's been a great journey with this organization. And I'm really excited to see what all the young people here on this call are going to do in the future. Exactly. We're so thrilled to see you all and have everyone here today. Um, I know that actually Madvi, you were very the very first person. So I wanted to um, have you. She had a quick comment about gray water conservation. So I know mm -hmm. we're we're just over our end time. So if people need to leave, great. If you're willing to stay around for a little bit longer and want to ask any other questions that we may have missed, please please feel free to stay on and um, and participate in that. And so I know, uh, Madhvi, you had a quick comment on gray water, if you wanted to, to mention that, um, before we, we end things here. Oh, do we have her? Are you here, Madhvi? Okay. Maybe we lost her. Well, thank you guys, everyone. Hello? Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. I'm from Ninja. Perfect. Uh, yes. No, sorry from Ninja. So yeah. Um, I heard um, I heard something about gray water, and so I'd like to talk about like the efforts I've done uh, with gray water conservation. Uh, so I am um, I'm a youth advisor or youth voice uh, with the with the Water Conservation Board, the CWCB, and um, at home I use a lot of gray water for watering for plants. Like yeah, when I wash vegetables or lentils or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Instead of like pouring into the drain, I pour it to the plants. So yeah, um, that's also another one of my efforts that I do and I'm promoting it a lot, um, pretty much everywhere I go. Well, wow. that's awesome. Maybe we can collaborate and figure it out. Maybe you, there's something that you could learn from the work I've been doing over the last seven or eight years on this issue. Yes, Happy definitely. I would love to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something we encourage all of you to do. Mm -hmm. I kind of skipped over that slide, but um, if you guys have not heard about it yet, there is a, a Eco Hero Alumni Facebook group. We would love for you to join. If you're not on Facebook, we are kind of open to um, other platforms. Uh, you know, if there's enough interest, we've been looking at a couple of different other places where, because we just really want to make sure we're fostering all of your connections. There's, as you saw today, a lot of crossover in the work that some of you've been doing with, and um, others have been doing across the world. So, however you can support each other and get and come together to to help make more action for nature, we're here to foster that and help support that. So, just wanted to make sure. There's a question here to that effect uh, from Roman for Shreya. Go ahead, Roman. Oh yeah, Roman. Yep. Yeah, Roman. Yeah, my question was that um, Shreya, you talked about using. Um, reusing like laundry water and bathing water mm -hmm. for irrigation. So my question was, how do you ensure that that water is safe and it's like extra nutrients or extra um, fertilizing agents in those chemicals that are mixed with the waters don't leach out into the soil? And this is a fantastic question. I actually did several years of research on this topic because it's a really, you really hit the nail on the head. It's a common a challenge. Um, so it turns out it just depends on the type of soaps and detergents that you're using. If you find there's certain environmentally friendly soaps, and I can dive deeper into it if you want, but essentially avoiding soaps that have um, salt, high levels of salts, boron and borax. Um, mm. If you avoid those types of soaps and detergents, then household gray water is safe for reuse um, in like agricultural and uh, gardening settings. And I particularly used soap nuts, which you may be familiar with, as an alternative mm. detergent. And that gray water can be used for irrigation um, without any challenges. Yeah. Bye, Barbara. I know you're signing off. So thank you to everyone. And thank you, Barbara, one of our absolutely phenomenal judges slash board members. Barbara, stay on for a group photo at the very end, potentially. For like oh, two minutes. yeah. I, this is a great idea. And Shrey, you have just been wonderful. Shrey has been helping me in the background all throughout this whole event to make sure we're getting everything going. And so thank you so much for Shrey. If, yeah, if everyone wants to turn on their camera really quick before we close it out, we're going to take a quick screenshot of the group, the rest of the group here. I think it's kind of a perfect, um, I don't know if Maria, if you're still on, if you can maybe, I'll, um, maybe I can do this. Yeah. Thank you to Charlotte, too. And yes. Charlotte, Thank your you, Charlotte. wonderful opening statement. And uh, everyone just, 
I always leave these events feeling so just inspired and um, hopeful and positive and just, it's just so amazing. So I just wanted to thank everyone for being here today. So, um, all Remember, right. do what you can when you can. Don't overload All right, yourself. we're waiting for Anirudh to rejoin because he's having trouble with his camera. Oh, so we're going to give it like okay. 30 seconds, maybe. Gonna, okay, and then gonna maybe speed we back. get Maria to join. I'll see if, okay, there we go. Okay, everyone. Oh, there you are. Yay, beautiful. Yay. There she is. Hi, Bridget. Hello, everyone. So good to see you guys. Okay, we're going to do okay. one. Two, I'm just going to start taking them and then we'll see how many. All right, everyone smile. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, everybody. Oop, one more, one more. Hold on. Almost there. Awesome. Thank you so Ooh. much. All right. Thanks. Congratulations, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone, Chris and Beryl, Barbara, our board, all of our Eco Heroes, Trey and Charlotte, you guys are amazing. And maybe one day one of you will be our co-hosts or speakers. <laughs> all right, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>